Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mindset Rx series of the Alpha Moon Podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and I work with functional athletes and build them with champs mindset. These podcasts highlight the methods that I teach the athletes that I work with and allow you to pick up the scalable, learnable mindset lessons from the best in functional fitness. Today is another great example of that where my guest and I focus on a surprisingly simple yet astonishingly powerful tool you can use to not only discover what is holding you back, but to catapult your trajectory towards your goals. That tool is language. Today's guest is master of the subject Mark England from Brickabulary. The lessons Mark has taught me have next to eliminated procrastination whilst boosting my self-belief what he talks about may sound simple but through my thousands of hours of coaching i've found that the best cues whether mindset or training based always are simplicity plus consistency equals success after all a couple of pieces of housekeeping first this podcast is growing ridiculously quickly yet it can reach even more people if you feel it's benefited you tell a friend or two or three or four and leave a review on itunes only five stars though of course of course next i'm opening up another inner athlete performance camp where you will master your inner athlete by learning how to give everything you can in words develop intense mental strength and create the mindset that the best in the world possess for those who want to create the champs mindset head on over to mindsetrx.squarespace.com slash iapc or send me an email on tom at alphamovement.co and you'll see a bunch of athletes who have all been through the process now i'm going to bring you the one the only mark england welcome to the show man thank you tom much appreciated brother good so let's give uh give the audience a super quick intro into who we are we'll dig into it in a bit more depth but um can you give the int- sorry let me start again <laughs> ironic that we're doing it on language and i can't speak um can you give the audience a quick intro into who you are and what you do Yes. My name is Mark England, and I'm one of the co-founders of Procabulary, which is a, a company that focuses on the power and the mechanism of language. And when I mean language, I mean our internal and external dialogue, how words and stories influence people, for better or for worse. I've been doing this full time. And when I mean this, I mean giving presentations, uh podcasts and coaching for the past decade and it is my profession and also my passion i've been introduced to large audiences as a language geek and there is truth in that so perfect perfect so um i'm always interested by travel and i want to hear about your story to thailand how you ended up there and how that kind of shifted you into language very cool yes well this i can start the story at a couple of places. Um, we'll go with martial arts. I started wrestling when I was in high school, and that turned into Brazilian jiu-jitsu in college, and we were also training kickboxing, Thai boxing, which brought Thailand into my awareness. So there was three things that got me to say yes to moving to Thailand, packing everything up, getting a plane, getting a plane ticket and, a, and, a, and my passport, in 2002. And one of those was Thai boxing. The other was the girl I was dating at the time. She was, uh, her parents were Southern Baptist missionaries. They had lived all over the place, Tom. And just some dude from Virginia. They had stories about cultures and, and destinations. It was really blowing my mind. And then the, the third thing was I got an email from career services my very last week of school before I graduated college and it said teach in Thailand and I really I remember opening that that email looking at it for two seconds and making the decision I wanted to be a pro fighter I was I'd done well on the amateur MMA circuit and the kickboxing circuit in Virginia and my dream was to that's all I wanted to do the plan <laughs> man plans god's laugh the plan was to move over to thailand teach train for a year come back and go pro and that's the exact opposite of what happened i moved over there wrecked my knee again had my second knee surgery and uh and ended up turning into a very bitter individual literally living my worst nightmare, which was over there. It's the Mecca of kickboxing, Mecca of Thai boxing. And I was sidelined and permanently in my mind. 
the amount of pain I was in, the what the doctor said verbatim. He said, your career, Mark, as a kickboxer is over, period. You can become a very good swimmer. <laughs> Um, what I, what I became was, uh, a very unhappy and bitter individual. And that, uh, I, at least, I at least had the wherewithal at that stage of the game. I was about 26 and a half, 27 years old to recognize that I could, I could act that out. I could act that way. I could be that kind of person for a, an extended period of time for, for literally decades of the rest of my life. And that scared me. So long story short, I started to look at the basics of what I was doing as far as what am I eating? What am I thinking? What am I focusing on? And I went down to um, repeatedly down to a fasting and detoxification spots, cleansing it, on the island of Koh Samui in the Gulf of Thailand. Spent a, a many, many vacations down there before I ended up moving there and started working there. Um, that's where I had my first introduction to language and story and how it influences us for better or for worse. I can continue in a variety of different angles about the 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 the, the highs and the lows. Uh, what would be most interesting for your for your audience? Let's go for like how did you how did you become aware of the language you're using? Was it someone influencing you, or is it something you picked up over time? And is did that was that facilitated through your training, or did your training kind of Push it to one side. Gotcha. There was a specific event, an evening talk, lecture at, at the spa with a man by the name of Barry Musgrave. I talk about him a lot when I do podcasts. And again, thank you for having me on. Uh, I've, been, I've been looking forward to this one. And he was doing a, a talk on, it was titled Emotional Detoxification. And you got to, let me, let me paint you a picture of the spa, the place. Okay, so it's on Lamai Beach, a beach, a beautiful beach on, in Koh Samui, on the water. And there would be, at the time, it was very busy. And interestingly enough, it was about 65, 70% Brits would come over there, most of them being professionals. There were a lot of professionals, um, a lot of professional females looking for a, a break. They would come and, and, and they would want to basically um, lose weight, get a break from their story so they could get some perspective. There was a lot of DJs coming over. They did a reality TV show back in the day. This is before reality TV was a thing, really. And they brought um, a bunch of British people over from different walks of life and filmed them going through this process, showed it all over Britain, and then then the masses came. There were lots of people there going through these detoxification programs, and there were world-class practitioners of all sorts of, we'll call them alternative healing modalities, coming through lecturing or living there and practicing. And Barry, at the time, while he did work there later, he was traveling through and, and he took one of his evenings and gave a talk on emotional detox and he started talking about language in a unique way, a way that I had never heard it spoken about and, and framed and he talked about how our words are reliable and the fact that they influence us in specific ways and that our language it creates experiences along with our emotions and our feelings and that the process of how we create story is flexible. We are participants in it, not victims of the mechanism. And so he brought up points that were very easy to relate to. He brought up uh, uh, more abstract scientific studies, and then he brought the whole thing together in an instant. He said, does anyone have any problems? Does anyone have a, a, got a story running? Is, is anyone upset about something? And this girl went, 
straight hand up in the air. I said, what's going on? He said, I haven't been in a relationship in over four years. My boyfriend cheated on me on vacation in front of all of our friends and then dumped me two days later. And I still, I still hate his guts. He said, okay, come on up. And he worked with this woman and he asked her to go through the story of what happened. And she did. And at the end of it, she was angry and crying. He said, okay, go through it again. This time, take out those three words and at the very end, put in this particular word. She did. Now, three minutes later, she was sad, no tears. He took her through the story a third time, adjusted a couple of the sentences, and when we adjust language, we adjust our perspective. So she went from, I'll take a note out of a book, a a page out of Charlie Chatwork, just to quote him, Charlie Chaplin, he said, life viewed under a microscope is a tragedy, viewed from afar, it's a comedy. So he helped this girl to go from this to this with her story. And in that, she literally got breathing room. And this is what she said. She goes, hmm, that guy was weird anyway. It, was, it wasn't even going to work out. Ten minutes later, she was, she, was, she, was, she was stuck. And I saw that and I said, that's not my story, but that's my story. And at the time, he said, if this interests you, you can do this work on yourself. It was emotional freedom te- technique, or known as EFT at the time. It still is. And that's what he was teaching. He said, go to this website, download an 80-page manual. You can do this work on yourself. I said, thank the Lord for two reasons. One, I'm all messed up in my head. I know this. That's why I'm down here. And two, I'm not talking to anyone about my story. I was very guarded. And so I went immediately. When I say immediately, I got up and went straight to the internet cafe when they used to have those kinds of things, downloaded the 80-page manual, went through it, and relentlessly worked on my stories, the ones that hurt the most. And guess what? I I felt better about things. And I saw some things changing in my life and my my rigidity and my emotional, it started to loosen up. I said, there is something here. So I went and trained with the founder in 2006, in the summer of 2006. So I spent five years in Bangkok teaching. I was an elementary school sports teacher. And upon completion of, of that contract, I went and went back to the States, trained with Gary Craig, the founder of EFT, and then went back out to the spa and worked as a practitioner there. And that's where I... I, so language, the understanding, the, the, the demonstration of what we understand about language, it is, in my opinion, uh, absolutely a skill and it's absolutely a practice. So by all means, I am very much still learning and will always be learning. Um, that's how I got started. <laughs> So let's go from start. Specific event. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I love that. I love the story behind it. So let's go from the start to how, what are the steps between there and a TED Talk? And then at the end, we can touch, touch on the TED Talk. Okay, cool. You, you mind if I back into this one? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So you with your clients and your, your, your workshops, you help people focus. Mm-hmm. One of the best ways that I've found to help focus and develop focus and then and 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 move forward with things is to write things down. So when about 2 years ago, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Born and raised and I very much love this town and we knew a TED Talk was coming. We'd gotten feedback and 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 inquiries and it was just a matter of time. And like I said, we knew it. And I said out loud, possibly 45, 50 times along with it being written, 
I want to do TEDx RVA. I want TEDx Richmond, Virginia to be our first TEDx talk. And I auditioned in 2016 and came in third. And I still kept that vision, very much so. And earlier this year, we got a phone call from TEDx RVA, which what an amazing experience that was. I didn't know this until the, the end. They are in the top 10 TEDx's in the world out of 5,000 for a, for a very good reason, is that they are just super professional and totally well-oiled from the intake call to the after party. I mean, they just nailed it. Anyway, we got a call from them. I believe it was in March. And they said, we'd like to interview you for a potential spot on this year's, uh, this year's show. And I had a conversation with them and uh, the rest is, is history. We did TEDx RVA 2017 on June 23rd and it was, it was to date. So I've been, like I said, I've been presenting publicly speaking for 10 years, Tom, and I've given 421 professional presentations. That one was by far the biggest as far as the number of people that we spoke in front of. So it was 1,800 people so in my hometown in the, in the most prestigious venue in, in Richmond, the Carpenter Center. I had a lot of friends there. And so, and, and TEDx is there, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a gift of an opportunity. Okay. And this is only coming once as far as that particular show, the, the, the whole thing. So we looked at this and decided it was really a no brainer that we're going to walk on stage supremely well prepared. And so we took, and like we were talking about before we started the, the, the show, our talk was on identity on the fluid nature of identity versus the current definition of identity. The current definition of identity is the fact of being who or what a person is versus people's experiences of themselves. So do you, I've been giving a series of presentations in, in Richmond since the, 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 the Ted talk. And I'll ask everyone in the crowd to write down these two statements. Statement one, they have a lot of confidence. Everybody write that down. They have a lot of confidence. Sentence two, they have developed a lot of confidence. They have developed a lot of confidence. And then I will ask them, What's the difference in those two sentences for you? And people invariably say, oh, well, the, the, they have a lot of confidence. Is, it's just, just st static. It's, that's the way they are. And, you know, um, kind of be nice to be born that way versus they have developed a lot of confidence. So that's more process-oriented. We, I, my goal walking on stage for the TED Talk was to be free in myself, to deliver this message from a place of freedom, freedom in my breath and in my mind and my emotions and feelings. So I could deliver this message the way we know it deserves to be because it's an important topic of conversation for a variety of reasons. You can put me in a, a, a Fortune 500 CEO boardroom right now and I will make the message supremely relevant to them you can put me in a CrossFit box anywhere in the country, and I'll make that message supremely relevant to them. Put me in a high school anywhere in the United States, I'll make that message supremely relevant to them, is that we have the ability to develop any aspect of our character that we choose to, and especially when we understand how much language influences that ability, that there is a very reliable mechanism, cause and effect response to how we think and what we say. And so in order to develop my confidence in the, the, the presentation, 
guess what, what, what does someone do when they want to develop their confidence? Because people just don't have confidence. They acquire it. They develop it. They build it. We, so for all of you aspiring TED Talkers out there, this is what you do. Once you get, get on the roster, put, put, make it a front burner conversation for yourself and practice it. Drill it. Get it in front of people. Bring in, bring in consultants for the first month. So we had a three months to prep. The first month, we distilled the message down into nine minutes. That's how much time we had. And my business partner and I have a way of, of working on scripts. And we call it ping-ponging. So I, would, I drafted it. He, he, the guy's a genius, by the way. Shout out to you, Adam Chin. And we went back and forth, back and forth. He would do his thing. I would do mine. It would go to him, come back to me, back and forth for a month until it just settled. And there was nothing else to do with it. Every word was conscious. Every word was crafted. And the message was, was very clear. Now, <laughs> now comes the, 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 the ability to present that very clear message under pressure. So I rehearsed that presentation somewhere between 75 and 80 times, okay, with rehearsals, videotaping it. I was over, when we met, this is one of the things we talked about over coffee at Ozone. It was what, I, what stage I was at in the, the development of our TEDx presentation, and I was very much in the middle of drilling that to the point where someone could have woken me up at 3.30 in the morning and shaken me and I would have given it verbatim, no ums, stutters, or glitches, okay? And guess what? We nailed it. I walked out there and I was. I was free in myself. And there is a very much a, you know, the bright lights are on you kind of thing. You look out and there's just, it's lights and heads everywhere. I th and, and that gets me thinking, you know, somebody like, a Tony Robbins or a rock star that looks out and they've got 20,000, 30,000 people out there staring at them. That experience fascinates me, by the way. And I had enough mental real estate because I had practiced to look out and right in the front row, right in the middle of about four minutes in, as I'm presenting, I look down and I see all of my friends from Richmond in the front row, people I've known for 20 years, 30 years, dudes I used to ride bicycles with. I'm 41 now. And I, it was, it was to, to say that it was a special moment for me, it was a, it was a transformational moment for me. Um, and our message is... Our message about identity, like I said, it's timely. It's timely. We're not stuck. We're not static. And I am thoroughly convinced that people can undo any kind of fear or phobia in them, in themselves. It's a, it's a, we, we are an ongoing fluid process. Was there anything else in the TED Talk? That was a lot of information, so, by the way. No, no, go for it. Go for it. Was there anything else in the run-up to the TED Talk, i.e. like any any length of time before it, that helps you prepare for it or calm nerves or like breath work or anything like that or visualization? Yep, yep. The Wim Hof method. Yeah. Very much so. A uh, good buddy of mine, Brandon Powell, is uh, one of the international instructors and he introduced me to the Wim Hof method two years ago. And I practice on and off. I've been practicing on and off for the past two years, mostly on. So I'd say, you know, three quarters of the, of, of, of three weeks out of the month, I practice the breathing. And that helped me a lot. The more that someone, whether it's for competition or a presentation or you're going out on a date, if someone wants to demonstrate or express confidence. So let me ask this way. When someone is confident, when they're expressing confidence, where are they breathing? Deep belly, I'm guessing. Deep belly. Absolutely right. And that 
methodology, it focuses when, when it's time to do the breathing part, it's all focused on maximizing lung capacity. And so that, that was very much a, 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 a part of my preparation for it. And what else influenced it? Uh, I, I was given a lot of presentations in Europe. So practice, 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 practice. The non-sexy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff that, you know, the, 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 I love the story of Jerry Rice, San Francisco 49er hall of fame wide receiver. Here's what, here's how the story goes is that he made a promise to himself that whenever the ball hits his hands, he's getting in the end zone. So when they would practice, they would, they would be, they would be practicing runs and, uh, uh, all the rookies, everybody else, they'd throw it. Somebody would catch it and they'd run 10 yards, come back around, get in line. Every single time that that dude caught the ball, didn't matter if it was 80 yards or 20 yards, it didn't matter. He was in the end zone. He would take it to the end zone. And that's the stuff that it's, it's like you said, it's the, it's the unsexy stuff. It's, not, it's, it's the stuff that you have to grind. You have to develop and really fuse that neural net into your mind so you can demonstrate whatever it is that you want to get better at when it's time sweet so let's um let's go back to how you got to the ted talk and how you that process went from thailand to ted many 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 hours of practice and contemplation uh on on language and story work whether that was trainings I was taking, presentations I was giving, uh, sessions I was facilitating, or my own work on my own story. I wouldn't, it would be a challenge for me to guess how many hours have gone into that. It's, it's, it's been a mild, it's been, <laughs> it's been a mild obsession for the very right reasons. Um, which is one of the reasons that we knew a TED talk was coming. We looked at what other people were saying in the field of, of, of language and uh, language and story development. And we liked our message as much as any of the, the top guys. And we have a different take on things and presented in our own style. And uh, yeah, like I said, we knew it was coming. Excellent. Nice. When we look at, at language, to bring this to more of an athletic basis, how is this influencing our athletic forms? Because it seems very conceptual. To, and like, I, I know when I first thought about this, and when I like when I first came across the idea of mindset as well, it's like, how does thought translate into performance? And in some ways, it's very obvious, but in a lot of the ways, especially the ways that you work it with, it's more subtle, but equally, if not more powerful. So, how does that translation go from Language to athletic performance. Okay, good question. And if it's okay, I'd like to ask you a question about that. So as a person that, that, that coaches and mentors and presents a lot, what are some of the, the scary thoughts, the scariest, most frequent negative thoughts that you see in a athletes contemplating, talking about, sharing, oh, struggling with? The various um, various examples or variants of I'm not good enough or um, like she's better than me or he's better than me or I should be here like there's 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 a bunch but usually it's is somewhere around I'm not good enough in our TED talk we bring that up specifically so the fear of and I agree with you 100% 100% I was talking to a uh, – doing a session with a, a gentleman that owns two CrossFit boxes this morning, and we talked about this specifically. The fear of not being good enough is technically known as a telephobia. And I – like I said, I very much agree that it boils down to that, some variation of I'm not good enough. And that right there – so it's one of the mo – it's the most – 
It's the most pervasive and most powerful, now listen to the words here, spells that people are under. Now, the definition of a spell, Tom, is a word or a combination of words of great influence. That's Webster's definition. That's it. A word or a combination of words of great influence. And when someone thinks to themselves, it's much more common to have that as an internal dialogue as opposed to external dialogue. When someone thinks that to themselves, let's go to language and and so we can answer your question in a variety of different ways. Let's build out some of the context here. Let's go to language and look at how or what it does. So language, when I say abracadabra, what do you, you knew this was coming, bro. I did know at some point. It was, it was in my notes. <laughs> when I say abracadabra, what do you think of just like that? I think of magic straight away. Magic straight away. Everybody does. Abracadabra is, there's more to it than that. I know you've taken core language upgrades, so you, you know. And how many conversations have we had so far? Several. Many. Not enough, many. though. Yeah, we're, we're just getting started, bro. Abracadabra is Aramaic, which is an ancient language. It's one of the two languages Jesus spoke, and it was the language the Old Testament was written in. Okay, so it's old. And it translates to with my word I create or with my word I influence. And we're going to tie this back in to athletic competition, I'm not good enough, and what to do with that spell here in a moment. With my word, I influence. With my word, I, what do I influence? With my word, I influence my imagination, my feelings and emotions, my physicality, and how I breathe. So... Let me, let me make this very relatable to everyone very quickly. I was coaching a young man, and this is, this is, uh, this is in a, a corporate environment. I was brought in to, to help develop a, a company culture, a company's culture is up in Calgary, and, and um, develop the way that their sales team interacted with customers. And I was coaching this one young man, and it was he and myself were in the same room, two chairs looking at each, uh, at each other talking. And this is, this is what he said, and this is what he did. Mark, I can't keep focusing on my past. For everyone who's just listening, you looked over your shoulder. I looked over my shoulder it, three times as fast as I did it. And I'm looking right at him. Of course I saw him do it. And I said, hey, you know, you just turned around and looked behind you, right? And he was shocked. He said, what, I did? Really? I said, yes. Did you make any mental imagery? Did you see anything? And he had to stop and think. He said, wow, yeah, I I did. I saw myself in chains. And he was angry and and anxious, stressed. And guess where he was breathing? (laughs) The opposite place someone does when they're demonstrating confidence or exuding confidence. He was stressed. He was chest breathing, shallow breathing, labored breathing. It's known as coastal breathing. His breath was trapped in his chest. And we had him take, so what was, what was his language doing? It was hitting those four areas of influence all at once. His imagination, his feelings and emotions, how he was breathing, and his physical body. Now, this brings language into a very real, everyday, tangible conversation for people. And it, it, it goes straight back to education. You're an educator. I'm an educator. Most people, and when I say most, I mean 99.999% of people's education about their language comes down to three static things, spelling, grammar, and definitions none of which teach anyone how to use their language to construct a, uh, an empowering, outcome-oriented, momentum-generating conversation with themselves about themselves. 
And what happens as a byproduct is from, from lack of understanding and, and knowledge, people create these I'm not good enough stories. So with that, that young gentleman specifically, I can't keep focusing on my past. Okay, that's a classic negation. Negations, talking about what we can't do, what isn't possible, what shouldn't happen, what hasn't gone right, and what won't work out anyway. They paint worst case scenario pictures in our mental imagery, create that stress response in our body, activate these negative emotions, trap the breathing, and the body does what it does. So we had him write that statement down. So one of the big takeaways for your audience for this presentation, in my opinion, should be the, there is an incredible amount of value for simply writing down your scariest thoughts about yourself. There will be some of you that resists. That's fine. Write them down and look at them. Write them down, look at them, and look at the language. And with a, I'll give you more context as we go and, and with the, the, just the basics that we'll cover in this, this, this podcast, you'll be able to, to look at your language in a different way. So I can't keep focusing on my past. He wrote it down. I said, okay, take out the can't and put in can. What can you start doing? So if you can't keep looking back there, where do you want to look? What can you focus on? Uh, my future? He asked it as a question. It was a new thought for him. I said, okay, yes, and make it a statement instead of asking yourself a question. So he's familiarizing himself. He's socializing his, this, this idea in his own mind. I, I, I can focus on my future. Wonderful. What parts of your future? Uh, my work? Yes, your work. What aspects? Uh, how I sell my organizational skills and, and accreditation. So you can see where this is going. We built those three things in 30 minutes. This guy had a, he had, he, he had a plan of where to take himself as opposed to this default negative conversation that kept him going like this, kept him staring at that and huh, like that. And for, and for I'm not good enough and variations of I'm not good enough, which absolutely, like you mentioned, entail comparison. Write it down in order to dispel it. The definition of a spell, a word or a combination of great influence. Dispel means to cast out. Cast out negativity. Okay? Same thing. What do we do with a bad habit? We break it. What do we do with a spell? break it. This is how you break that spell. I'm not good enough. Okay. That's like I said, that's an all encompassing statement that just, it paints everything in this hazy ugh, veneer. I'm not good enough for what? Well, I'm not good enough to, 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 to be on this, this team of elite athletes. Okay. Are you on that team of elite athletes? Yeah. Then are you good enough to be on the team of the, that team of elite athletes because you're on that team of elite athletes? Well, yeah, I guess when you put it that way, yes or no. Yes. Yes. What? Yes. I am good enough to be on a team of elite athletes. And a lot of times people use the, I'm not good enough or a variation of it to, as Byron Katie says, argue with reality. Here's an example. Of, of, she is in the CrossFit world, and she said, I'm not the kind of person that has purple hair. I'm not the kind of person who gets tattoos, and I'm not the kind of person that has successful biz- a successful business. Okay? Guess what she had? Go on. At the time of saying that, she had purple hair. <laughs> Guess what else? Successful she business. And tattoos. <laughs> and so she went from saying those things to writing down what she actually did have. And because she had it, it means that she's good enough to have it. Does that make sense? Yes. 100%. Yes. 100%. Very cool. And that's a very good example of
why it's very valuable to write down how we're thinking about things. And e- even just the fact of doing it, it will, you'll, you'll, you'll externalize it. I'll externalize it. I do externalize it. I write down my thoughts frequently and have benefited greatly from it. And I just I, I take a look at it. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. And make adjustments to the language. Make adjustments to the syntax, the syntax, how the language is constructed. Okay. So I'm guessing then from what you just said, you use writing in two different ways. Firstly, to discover and secondly, to create. Is that 100%. right? Yes. Okay. Sweet. Yes, very much so. So have, um, have clients of yours used anything other than writing to create or to discover these stories that tell themselves? Yes. A very reliable way to know if someone is using what we call in vocabulary conflict language. So conflict language, it's, it's the language of, of chaos and stress and derailment and and disempowerment and eventually failure. A good way to know that I'm thinking in a certain way about things is how I'm feeling and where I'm breathing. I know that if I'm all locked up about something, there is a linguistic component to it. And I can backtrack, excuse me, and and get my language down on that. So it's like a, it's like a, a referee. You know, when the, the soccer ball, the football goes out of bounds, the guy, he flags it like that. It's the same thing. That's one way. Um, another good way. It's a dog. Another good way is to watch other people. Okay. To back into the converse, to, to, to externalize the conversation about language. Look at other people. So. Everybody knows someone who complains a lot. Next time you get a chance, focus in. Instead of believing their story, oh my gosh, you wouldn't believe what this person did to me, and then they did that, and then they said that, and could you believe it? Have you ever had that experience? And oh, who do they think they are? Instead, <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get animated. <laughs> Instead of believing those stories and just leaning right in, pay attention to the language, Okay. Pay attention to the language that they're using. And guess what? They're going to be projecting. There's going to be projections there. So he won't let me live my life. Or she always embarrasses me. Or you know, my father is so controlling of me. Or just what those, those, are, that's the, those are examples of projections. Or this is a lot of fun. Pay attention to how the most indecisive person that you know speaks. Guess what they're going to be using a lot of? Mm -hmm. Soft talk. Say it with me now, Tom. Soft talk. Soft talk. (laughs) (laughs) Did, uh, have you, have you recognized that? And when you're out and about talking to people, just a little bit. And I was just going to drop in actually that when like, after going through your course, I went through my emails just as like a little kind of clearing thing and going through my emails. It was fucking hilarious. Honestly, like the amount of soft talk in there was ridiculous, especially like, um, conversing with people for the podcast, for people who are interested in my coaching services is there was a lot of should have, could have possibly might maybe <laughs> like that. And it's, um, it's something you, you absolutely don't realize, but once you start, identifying other people and then identifying yourself. It's, yes. it's so powerful. I, I totally agree. That's, it's a great way to, we're so familiar with the way we talk. We're so familiar with the way we think so much. I mean, it's, it's literally right under our nose and right between our ears. It's very close to home, very, very close to home. So observing other people, how they act when they say certain things, especially when there's, when there's conflict, you know, whether it's a fight or a, Oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. And maybe I should do this and um, umming and erring, put the dots together there 
and work backwards. Okay. And I commend you, man. That's a, that's a world-class exercise is to go back through things that you've already written and, and do a diagnostic run of the language. And you, you take, you took the whole course. You're a smart guy. You've to some degree have decreased the amount of soft talk in your language. Mm-hmm. What's, what's the effect of that? for you what's the experience of that for you oh it's 100 percent clarity it's forward focus and this is the way i'm going and there's no bullshit anymore there's no and you can see how this translates to training as well instead of like oh i might train now and i should really kind of get some supplements and like becomes i'm gonna buy some supplements here and i'm gonna train on this day or how about this one i think i might actually be over training (laughs) that's the big one that's the big one. So as a coach, what would you say if I was your client and I said, Tom, I think I, I think I might actually be overtraining here. Well, are you, aren't you, how many times you're training? Exactly. Straight to the point. The, the, the question about the conversation about whether I am or, or not gets brought right to the forefront. And there's a whole lot of value in that. And my, my personal experience with, remediating and diminishing my usage of soft talk and coaching people about doing the same is that a vast majority of the time when someone says something al- along the lines of, you know, I, I might, I might actually be overtraining or I probably could spend more time with the kids or, you know, I, I, I guess alcohol might actually be, be messing up my, my, my training regime, we take the soft talk out and it's, it's 99.9% of the time. It's true. Okay. And from there we can make a decision. I ask that in my seminars. I'm raise your hand. If you love prolonged bouts of indecision and everybody's like, ha ha, it's funny. Yet there's, there's the reality that people create that for themselves by accident unconsciously with conflict language, with soft talk, also known as a verbal litter. Nice. Are yes. there any super common examples other than ones you've, you've mentioned? Because I know you're, you're kind of in and out of the cross the area as, as, well, as well as a lot of other stuff at the moment. But is there, are there any super common examples that you hear time and time again? Specific statements? Of maybe not only soft talk, but projections and negations as well. Around competition, negating around competition, man, I, 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 I just can't mess this up. You know, I hope, I hope I don't get in there and, and, and fail. I don't want everybody to think I'm not good enough. I don't want people to, 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 to think I'm not tough enough. I don't want people to, to, to not be able to trust me. What have I just done? Five times in a row, with my word, I create worst case scenarioville in my mind. And guess what I do? I create that, that micro dose of stress. I create a stress response and it totally adds up. And if I'm an athlete and it's my rest day and I'm thinking about and, and envisioning worst case scenarios, I'm just on the couch, like all like tightened up and barely breathing. I'm blowing, th- I'm, I'm blowing my training. I'm setting myself up for failure accidentally. I'm practicing failure. I'm looking at it in my mind right there, full screen technicolor. And not only am I looking at it, I get to live it. I get to breathe it. I get to create the energy of it, really step into that reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big deal. And those, those statements. Okay. So if I don't want people to, I don't want people to not be able to trust me. And, and, and when it, when it all matters, okay, I want, I want people to be able to trust me in competition. Now I'm looking at what I do want big difference. Let's look at the language. Let's take it a step further. I do want people to be able to trust me in competition. Okay. Let's take out people and put in myself or me. I want me to trust me in competition. Okay. What do I have to do 
in order for me to trust me in competition. I have to stop doing these three things and I have to start doing this. Because guess what? We do know what we need to do. I knew what I needed to do in order to, to, to nail the TED Talk. And you know, I did it. The, a story that I will, I will, I remember it. I remember the first time I heard it, 14 years old. My dad was a collegiate football player. And one of his buddies, Charlie Tysinger, he walked up, he was, he was on the second string, and he walked up to the coach, Coach Tolly, and he said, Coach, I want to be first string. I want to start. I know I can do it. Tell me what I need to do. Just, just tell me, and I'll do it. I'll do anything. And the coach goes, you know. And he did. He did know what he needed to do, and he went and did it, and he started he started that he started the next couple of games and finished out the season that way. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So we know. Oh, well, we know. Mm-hmm. I love this. I think this leads really nice into or really nicely into the world of goal setting and mm. how you focus on that because you seem to be like every single good coach very focused on being process driven. Yes. So how, how does that intertwine with, with goal setting and how do you work that into working with athletes? Wonderful. One of the best ways to help people, in my personal and professional opinion, one of the very best ways, arguably the best, to, to keep people focused on the goal, so the big picture, and the very next steps is to have both of those things written down. Write, writing down our goals. So the fastest way, the difference between a, a dream and a goal, a dream is in my head and a goal was written down on paper. The language, we get the language of what is what we are doing. We write down the whys. This is very interesting. So a specific technique about this, the power of because. In Dr. Robert Cialdini's book, Influence, The Power of Persuasion, they do a fascinating study of well, numerous. One of them is around the word because. So what they did is they had someone go into an office or a, a copy room in an office during peak copy hours. They had the person go to the back of the line, wait, and then go to the front of the line and say, excuse me, I, can I get in front of you? 66% of the time, the person let them in, okay? Then they had that, those same people, different day, of course, go to the front of the line and say, excuse me, can I get in front of you? Because if I get these copies done in the next 15 minutes, I can have them to my boss for the meeting or because I'm late for my dentist appointment or because pretty much anything. And their success rate went up to 94% success of, so when we have the whys, it's the, we need the what, and we need the why written on paper and we need to review it. We need to drill it into our mind. So let that conversation sink down into, 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 into the, into the background noise, crowd out the other stuff. Okay. Okay. Word of the year, mother of all skill, repetition. They went so far with that, that study about because they would have people go from the back of the line to the front of the line and say, excuse me, I'd like to get in front of you to make some copies because I need to make some copies. 93%. 93% of the time. That's how powerful the word because is. That's how powerful the why is. And Having things for me personally, my training regime, having my rest days built in, I like to to minimize the conversation as much as possible, okay? I like to keep stories short, short and sweet in my mind so I can, here's an example, man. This This is a true story. Last Wednesday, my car got stolen. Nice car, nice neighborhood. It got jacked, dude. I walk outside. I have a presentation at 8 o'clock in the morning. 
I walk out, look at where my car was, was parked, blink several times, look around, look back. It dawns on me. It's gone. Three minutes later, I walk back in, call my dad. I call the guy that I'm, that's hosting the presentation. I said, buddy, my car got stolen. I'm about to call the police. I do not know what this, this process will entail. I will keep you posted. The presentation started at 8. The police came, filed a report. I w- went upstairs, and I was walking out the door to go. Went upstairs, got dressed, came back down. I was there at 11, 8, 8, 8 11 a.m., 11 minutes late. Because I was able to decrease, I was able to keep the story short. Nice. Okay? Because guess what? Life is going to throw us curveballs. Any athlete will tell you that. Any professional will tell you that. Any mother will tell you that. Any father will tell you that. Any anybody will tell you that. It's, it's, it's just it's a big series of surprises. People say, oh, I hate surprises. I'm like, you're in the wrong place, man. <laughs> I mean, think about the amount of surprises your life has had the, the, the past year. Tons of them. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that to happen. Didn't expect that conversation to go that way. Wow, that was amazing. Didn't see that one coming. So our ability to accept, what's, to, 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 to see what's going on, dude, what, what am I going to do? My car is gone. I have no control, okay? What I do have total control of is the story that I create about my car being gone. That's where my leverage lies. It's like, okay, psh, 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 bang presentation, get there. I did a podcast three hours later that same day too. Nice. Um, and guess what? That's a skill. 15 years ago, I would have spazzed. I would have. Um, so yes, writing things down, it will help develop focus. You will get, you will get insights and ideas about whatever it is that you're focusing on. Let's say it's for athletes. It'll keep. It'll help keep the drama level low. Yeah, buddy of mine is um, Rick McCoy. He's the first professional mixed martial arts fighter in the in the state of Virginia. He owns the MMA Institute. Um, so back to Wim Hof. This is where my friend came and did the two Wim Hof workshops that we had him do this year. He said it's not the fighter that gets really wild and aggressive. He's like, he says it's, it's the fighter that's able to walk in the ring with their heart just going boom, 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 boom. It's that steely-eyed focus. Those are the dangerous guys. Okay, And whether it's you want to be dangerous or whether you want to be proficient at a tough mutter, you, you pick whatever your outcome is. The people that are able to develop a certain kind of story – about themselves and what they're doing, and then then manage and navigate the inevitable curveballs that are coming. Those are the people that that, generally speaking, they're they're at the top. Champions are at the top for a reason. And I've heard numerous coaches from numerous different sports say that last five percent, the last three percent, it's all mental. The last five percent, it's mental. It's the mental game. People get the mental game right. They can be less of a, a, a gifted athlete, okay, and, 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 and have their mentality be their edge. I love how you took what on the surface appears to be a very woo-woo thing of writing your goals down. And people, people like hear it, especially when I'm, I'm speaking to them, like writing down who you want to become. It's a big deal. When they, when they hear it, they're like, oh, that's, that sounds like bullshit. But then they don't appreciate why it's not bullshit and how it focuses your mind on the possibilities rather than on everything that could go wrong. Absolutely. We talked about this earlier today and, and other times. That brings the conversation of emotional immunity into the conversation. 
So my car gets boosted and my emotional immunity to it was high. Okay. It's like, it's up here. So it's saying, let's, let's, somebody says something to you. Oh, you'll never do that. Are you kidding? <laughs> and you're like, what's for lunch? It just right past you as opposed to, oh, that person, they, they, I can't even believe they would say that to me. Would you? And then you go find somebody else to, to tell the story to and get them involved. <laughs> they, they just, they just they insulted me in front of all those people. <laughs> That's the art and science of failure, and there is absolutely a, 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 a language component to it, a thought process to it, one that is very dependable, one that is habitual, and one that is, I'm going to say it, addictive, and it's the victim mentality. Conflict language, this is a true story. We filmed Core Language Upgrade, the course you took twice for one reason. That one reason was conflict language, before it was called conflict language, was called victim mentality language. We, we shot the whole course and looked at it and we're like, it's too strong. People are going to flinch. It's just, it's too much. We got to do something with that. So we did. And it's, it was, it was the right move. The definition of the victim mentality, so conflict language, it scripts inevitably because it has to. Two plus two equals four for you, myself, and all of your listeners all day, every day, and forever. The definition of the victim mentality, which is the kiss of death to amateur athletes, professional athletes, people trying to, to beat their PR, people that are trying to lose that extra 15 pounds, people that want to be better at anything. Okay, it's the, it's the death by a thousand cuts. The definition of the victim mentality is an acquired, learned personality trait where a person tends to regard himself or herself as the victim of the negative actions of others, even in the absence of clear evidence, period. The victim mentality depends on a habitual thought process and attributions. It is dependent. Depending means it has to have and habitual is very, it's a very telltale word in that, in that definition, which implies time. There's a, there's, there's a, a, a period of time in the development, the acquisition, the, 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 the learning process of how to see ourselves as a victim. I'm going to tie this back into writing goals down and, and becoming the person that write down the person you want to become. Oh, that doesn't make any sense. Why would I do that? You'd want to do that because of something called the reticular activating system. We'll get back to that. So a habitual thought process, habit, it's a habit. What, do, what are habits? Smoking, drinking, pick one. They're addictive. The victim mentality, because of the, 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 the way that we're geared. Tom, think of the most empowered focused person that you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. How easy is it to get them out of that mindset? Oh, very difficult. Very difficult. Guess what? They're addicted to that mindset. Mm -hmm. Think about the most disempowered person you know. Mm -hmm. How hard are they to get out of that mindset? Yeah, you're 100% right. Very hard. Yeah. They're addicted to it. They'll claw, scratch, do whatever to keep it there. The reticular activating system, this is fascinating. Excuse me. And all of, I have one, you have one, all of your listeners have one. It's a, it's a part of our hardware and our brain, and it's responsible for a, a searching and, and editing things, information. So most people have had the experience of they see a couple of car commercials or their friend gets a new car and then you're driving around and then you see, start to see more of that particular car out there. Like, what's going on? Why are there more you know, blue Volkswagens out in the world? Guess what? There's not. What I've done is I have given, my, given the signals to that part of my brain that, that when, and, and that's through repetition. 
Okay. If I watch a car, car commercial one time, okay, cool. If I watch that same car commercial 10 times in a row, I'm far more likely to go pick that information up or see that car when I'm out and about. And not only am I seeing more blue Volkswagens, guess what else I'm doing? Thinking of them. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm thinking of them and I'm not seeing as many red trucks. Nice. Because the reticular activating system, it edits out mm-hmm. other information nice. as well, anything that's not in relation to it. So how does, that, how does that apply to our character? When you work with someone about becoming, and I'm sure you have exercises for this, when you, when you work with someone about becoming that, the character that they want to be, how do you go about doing it? Well, there's, uh, there's a bunch of different ways, but it's essentially talking to them, like opening up that discussion, like talking about where they are now, who they like, what kind of people they idolize, what, where their holes are in their game and building out that story in a more positive light. And how long, generally speaking, does it take that person to start to express more of those traits? Uh, there's there's some that come like that. There's others. They like the belief. Obviously, take a bit more time to under undermine or to mm. uh, uh, um, or to create a more positive story there. But some of them just instant. And do you find that a lot of the times they're already expressing those character traits to a degree yeah. and the recognition of them? Mm -hmm. It brings it more out of them. Yeah, 100%. What you're doing with the conversation and the, you're directing their focus on a certain thing. Okay. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a character trait that they're already expressing some of, or it's something that they want to be. And because you've gotten them to look at it and recognize it and place their awareness on it for a moment, the reticular activating system, same, same thing it does for the cars. It doesn't care. It doesn't, it's not meant to make decisions. It's meant to take orders. So it focuses on that. It deems it important. And then it starts to bring that into their awareness more and more often. So someone who grew up hearing their father say, oh, people can't be trusted. You can't trust people. You just, don't, 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 you just can't trust people. What they will do because they have they have taken that information in and it has been deemed important. Let's say they go out into um, uh, uh, professional environments. Guess what they're going to do? Because guess what? You're going to meet people that are not trustworthy. And guess what? You're going to meet people that are trustworthy. Guess what they're going to do to the people that are trustworthy? Of course, they'll, <laughs> they'll judge them and think, oh, look for examples of not being trustworthy. And Exactly. Yeah. They'll edit them out, even in the absence of clear evidence, back to the definition of the victim mentality. And it's the same thing with with, uh, uh, developing our positive traits as well. Whatever we focus on expands. So, And then there's the power of proximity conversation. So guess what? If I want to get better at something, let's get (laughs) – when I want to get better at movement and when I want to understand more about strength training and when I want to, to, to develop my, my practices, my physical practices more, guess who I go hang out with in Southern California? People are very good at it. As in Mike Bledsoe. Good man. Mike Bledsoe, Kenny Kane, Marcus Gersey, the Barbell Shrug guys. Big shout out to you all. I love those cats. And because the, they are, it's called the power of proximity. If you want to get better at anything, go hang out with people that are already good at it. Good at it. If, you want to, if you want to be more punctual, what would you suggest a client do? Hang out with people that are always late or hang out with people that are always on time. Exactly. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. And because 
everybody would say, oh, well, hang out with, with the people that are always on time. And, you know, you know, you'll just, you'll naturally be more on time. It'll kind of rub off on you and you'll learn what they do. That, that's a demonstration of people being able to develop any character trait that they want. Okay. In a very no brainer scenario. Exactly. That's awesome. Are there any athletes that you look at that you think they use language masterfully? Conor McGregor. Yeah. I was hoping you are going to say that. Yeah. Um, do you have any examples of things he said? N- no. And I have an, ex- I, I focus on his body language. Mm-hmm. So when someone starts talking about the fact that Jose Aldo has got just the most wicked leg kicks in the world and he's going to chop him down and Conor McGregor has no chance. Or when Chad Mendez is the most powerful wrestler he's ever faced and he's got a, he's got an iron like guillotine and he's going to get taken down or Eddie Alvarez. It's a, Eddie's just too tough. He's from Philadelphia. He's just too tough. Any time, and I've, watched, I've been watching this for years. Okay? It's the only sport I follow, MMA. Any time that an idea or concept that is out of alignment with what Conor McGregor wants goes into his ears, this is what he does. He'll, 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 like, he'll shake it off. His nervous system is so jacked and focused and strong that it just shakes that shit off like a wet dog. It's wild to watch. I've never seen anything like it. And guess what? We've never seen anything like him. And there's a reason for that. However the guy did it, whether it was, it's just the stars aligned for that creature uh, with physical talent, timing, and he's obviously trained his mind like a Jedi because he's pulling off things that have never been done. It, in one sense, it really doesn't matter what happens between him and Floyd. It doesn't matter. He made that happen. He made that happen. No he one else could have done that. No one. Not one single person in MMA could have done that. Not even Ronda Rousey when she was on top. Not even close. Yeah. So when someone wants – the uh, uh, to study, uh, uh, they want to. They want a, a, a clinic in the art and science of words, of language, internal dialogue, and external dialogue, creating your reality. Look at that guy, nice. and take notes because yeah. he's the mark. He's awesome. I think there's so much for people to work on in, in just this bit of the conversation. We'll have to do a part two because there's so much more to touch on. Um, where can people find out a bit more about you? Um, and where, like, I'm going to put it straight out here. Um, where can people get core language upgrade as well? Um, cause cool. I think it will really help people. Very cool. Core language upgrade. Super easy. Go to procabulary.org and go to courses. Okay. Click a three-minute promotional video. You'll get to see me in a beard go off on I love how. the beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I did too. You'll get to, you get to hear me rant and rave about how kick-ass Core Language Upgrade is and what it will do for you and how it will do it and what you can expect to show up in your life from making some adjustments in how you think and how you speak. And then there's a coupon code box a couple of clicks in, enter next level, all one word, doesn't matter about case sensitivity. That's a $100 coupon code. The the course is $300. With the coupon, it goes down to $200. You have access to those videos forever. So what we recommend, it's a 21-day course, 10 minutes a day. You go through it, and it acts like an IV drip of this information and it just, it saturates in and you start to you understand more about words and stories and how powerful we are. We are reality creating machines. We're, we're all going to use language. We're all going to think thoughts. We're, we're all going to have conversations. We're all going to create mental imagery. We're all going to create feelings and emotions. We're all going to breathe and we're all going to move our body. Okay. 
the more you understand about how to leverage your language, the better you'll get at all of that, and things will fall into place, period. Our TED Talk will be out in a couple of weeks. That's on the, the, the on identity and the fluid nature of it. It is a process and not a static, stuck thing. And, uh, yeah, I'll send that link to you. Send it out to your, your audience. Please share that. It, it's, a, it's an exceptionally empowering, positive message. And I would very much, very, very much like to do part two, Tom. Sweet. Well, I can't wait for that. Um, thank you so, so much. I can't My pleasure. tell you how much I appreciate your time. Dude, I appreciate you too, man. You're doing awesome stuff, dude. Awesome thank work. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Mindset RX series of the Alpha Moon Podcast. Remember to check out the Inner Athlete Performance Camp at mindsetrx.squarespace.com slash IAPC to hear about more, to hear more about even how you can create the champ's mindset and learn to embrace hardship instead of shying away from it. Remember, I've got seminars, my Mindset RX seminars, all throughout the UK over the next few months until the beginning of 2018. And then from 2018 onwards, we start the World Tour. If you're interested in that, head on over to mindsetrx.squarespace.com slash seminars. And I'll see you soon for another episode of the Alpha Moon Podcast and its Mindset Rx series. <laughs>